ecstatic to have you. This is a dream come true in so many ways. The very first album I ever listened to on repeat. I was eight years old, I had a Walkman on my hip, I had headphones with a wire rim on them, and I was blasting out to Mr. Gasoline. Some lyrics were more age appropriate than others, as you'll see tonight. But I remember singing Hamburger Dream and 98 Degrees in the Shade. And that was my childhood, so I'm very lucky to have such an artistic renaissance man of a dad. And then as I got older, my dad would tell me about his nightly five to sometimes 15 mile walks. And he said every night the songwriting muses would visit him. And songs would just come raining down from the ether. And he, had, he carries note cards and a pen always in his lapel pocket, inside pocket, so that he can capture the lyrics as the muses visit every night, as well as practicing his original, the OG ugh, that we're gonna hear tonight of songs that he wrote, some of them 40 years ago, right around the time I was born. And it's just absolutely our joy to have you all here to experience this, to be here in New York City. There's original Jim Blake art for sale as well, if you want to keep safe as you uh, come or go. And then depending on interest, we'll see. We may go to the Art House Hotel afterward for the after party. With that, I'll turn it over to Michael to say a few words. My husband, my husband. <laughs> I was going to say a few words, but I think you said it all. I just want to say, we're so proud of you. And live from New York, it's Mr. Gasoline! It's uh, a pivot point of a 40-year journey. Uh, I was in Athens, Greece 40 years ago, sitting in the Hilton Hotel Cafe, thinking that this architecture is driving me crazy. I need, to go to the end. I need something where it's just me and you don't have anybody hovering over you messing with your creation. So, so i got to have this parallel career. And uh, it's, uh, it's been very fascinating to take a dream, which is really 100% dream, just neurons floating around, disconnected from reality, and to realize all the little steps between a dream and standing here tonight. Uh, and there have been countless uh, signposts, little events, little achievements across these 40 years that have gotten me closer to tonight. So tonight is an incredible pivot point for me in that uh, it's the first night where I've been able to carry the songs solo. Uh, I had a rock and roll band in the San Francisco Bay Area back in the, gosh, late 80s, early 90s. And when you have six or eight people on stage uh, and you have to hire a guitar player, uh, it's, there's something off about it. It's like, well, gee, this is too much like architecture. I've got to call all these people, I've got to coordinate with the club owners, i got to do this and that. And it turned out that making music got to be just like making buildings. It was like there's just as much bullshit here <laughs> as there is in getting a building built. And I thought, well, i got to do something to, to clear the decks, to get it simpler. And I thought, to do that, I have to learn to play guitar. And as you all know, your neurons start to solidify at about age 25. <laughs> and, and it gets more and more difficult as the years go by to input this kind of eye-hand coordination thing. So I started learning guitar at age 62, when my brain is pretty much concrete. So whatever it's going to be, that's what it is. And it's like, the muses, the, the universe was saying, we dare you to try to learn to play guitar. And I bought an old guitar and I started playing and practicing every day. This was right around the Bush Obama Depression, 2008. So the gods pulled a plug on architecture 
I had plenty of time for my, my residential architecture practice evaporated, and I had plenty of time to learn guitar, so I spent eight hours a day with this old guitar, learning the fun of my campfire chords. You know, like happy birthday. <laughs> I mean, a happy fucking birthday. I always got it. Nah, nah, nah. And after about two years of that, I thought, wow, you know, I've associated this guitar playing with a song that I wrote. I have, uh, of my 32 songs that I have recorded, I have about eight of them that are just simple beyond belief. They're three chord songs. Uh, I thought, well, I can, I can learn, take one of my simple songs and match it up with this guitar skill, and I can sing and play at the same time. Wow. So I had a little breakthrough there when I could actually coordinate my guitar study with the songwriting. And then a friend of mine, I got to know a lot of musicians when I had the band in the Bay Area, and one of them said, well, why don't you come over to our house party? We're gonna, we're gonna all kind of share our songs, and we're gonna have a professional recording uh, set up there and we're gonna sing and record and all that, why don't you come on over? So I go over there in this big house of 20 or 30 people, and, uh, <clears throat> and there's some fabulous musicians, that, there are these dudes that just came in from Nashville, you know, the guitar cats, they had the $3,000 guitars, they had voices like angels, they're singing their songs, oh man, it's wonderful. And then uh, after about an hour of that, they said, well, Jim, why don't you try this? So. Uh, one of these guys handed me his guitar, this like $3,000 Gibson, I've been playing on like the Sears model for the actions, like an inch off the fretboard and all that. So he hands me this sophisticated guitar and I'm sitting here trying to sing my, the simplest song I have in my entire catalog as I'm playing this guitar. And the guitar was so sophisticated that I, I couldn't get from one chord to the other. So it was an incredibly kind of foundational experience, let's say. Uh, so I left that experience thinking, well, it sounded like hell, but it was pivotal in that I had established uh, an effort. I made an effort to do it. And then five years later, I'm in Nashville. And I decide, well, I've been practicing for five more years. I'm five more years better than I was when I stuck at the room back in Redwood City. So I figure I'll go to this uh, open mic in Nashville. And it's called Douglas Corner. It's a very, it's world-renowned venue in Nashville where singer-songwriters get discovered. So you have the Nashville uh, record label, A&R people are there, and there were people that night that I played from Australia, from Canada, from France, they flew down from Vermont, they came out from California. It's, I mean, it was that kind of a place. You can make your career by playing your song at Douglas Corner. And uh, so I get on that bill, you have to wait on the phone for a few hours during the day, and they give you a slot. And around 11 o'clock, they call my name, and so I go up and I play this, another simple three chord song. This is, Three years after the first song, still just a nightmare. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Whoa, this is like, you know, there were 50 people performing that night, and I was easily the most problematic. And I thought, wow, it's just three chords, and you're still having all these problems. So I keep practicing, 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 blah, 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 and on and on and on. So, <laughs> that was like eight years ago. So about three years ago, I hired a guitar teacher. <clears throat> I know this is going on too long. It's like, why don't you just play your songs and show them? <clears throat> but I uh, hired a guitar teacher, and I, and I told this guy, I said, I want to learn to play the guitar for one of my songs every week. So every week, we're going to have a checkpoint. We're going to have this milestone, uh, and I'm committed to it. So I started that two and a half years ago with this guy. Came in every week, super smart young guy. Uh, and, uh, and so I practiced all week long one particular song. So I'm really chopping up the problem into these bits that I think I can manage. So for the last two and a half years, I've been going over my songs, one after the other after the other, trying to learn to just 
get a strong connectedness of weary. It's phenomenal how hard that is when you don't start when you're 12 or when you saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. You know, for most rockers my age, it was like, well, when they were 13 or 12 or 8, they saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, they got a guitar and they started. And, uh, and it just kind of is part of growing up, is to have all these neurons associated. But, uh, so it was, it was a challenge, but I was always excited about the idea of doing exactly what I'm doing here, which is uh, try to put them together. So that's what I'm going to do here tonight. <laughs> years ago, and I was uh, on my way back to the pad I was staying in in the East Village, and I was walking from, where was it, uh, Times Square uh, over to the East Village, and I was crossing Union Square, and off in the distance, I could see this very bright light, it's dark outside, it's lit 10, 10 o'clock at night, uh, and it's a ring, it's this bright ring, it's about 150 feet in diameter. And I thought, what's going on over there? It looked like a spaceship that landed. And as I got closer, I could see that it was a ring of people. And I got closer still, and I could see a camera crew in the center of the ring with this real expensive video camera set up on a tripod. There was a microphone on a 30 foot boom, it's the big, you know, the big expensive microphones. There was a director who was there directing his two assistants and they it was a rap a thon where street rappers that came down from wherever all over the greater New York area were gathered in this ring doing their raps. And each rapper performed for about yeah, a minute and a half. And so I could see that they're way up. They're maybe 180 degrees away from me just going rapper to rapper to rapper to rapper. And as they got closer to me, I just thought, well, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a Calvin Klein black sport coat. <laughs> uh, you know, white shirt. And he's getting closer, and I just think, oh, geez, I could do that. <laughs> I have a song like that that might fit in. It's kind of James Joyce meets Eminem. <laughs> and, and that might, you know, that could go for a rap song, maybe. So he goes closer and closer, and I start getting more and more nervous. I think, I could do this. So I squeeze my way up to the inner part of the brain. It's four people deep. And I'm standing there, and this guy's a minute away. He gets closer and closer, and then he finally gets to me, and he points right at me. He looks at me and says, you, you want to do it? You're in for this. I just said, sure, what the hell? So I get out in the middle of this ring. I remember my cowboy finds for him. Cash on the dashboard, politics, heavy betting stash on the backseat, good boys never letting bad girls get ahead, leave my luck in a trunk. <laughs> Scott start talking, it's a hooch bag barrier, dark eyes scarier than anything, brushing up a cheekbone fall on the windshield of my Chevrolet gear stick, wiggling, whisper, tickling, stop, but the smile gets bigger, I'll go ahead and figure it just this once, I'm a dashboard politician, get my love on the run. <laughs> Dreadlocks coming all over his head. The Jamaican guy pulls his spleef out of the place and says, Ah, das cool, man. <laughs> so I, I felt like that was a milestone. Some sort. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to open the show here tonight with Dashboard Politician. <laughs> Yes, in the moonlight, walking on a high side, sipping up a big pony, 
this list can go on all night long. <laughs> I love the stars on the buttons of your transparent blouse, your grace under pressure at your grandma's house. You got reason, reason. States all the way to Vancouver, Canada. It's called the I-5. And when you're about an hour north of Los Angeles, the highway goes past a cattle feedlot that contains about a million cattle. And they're standing out there just thinking up the world. You drive by it at 80 miles an hour and you can smell them for 30 seconds at least. So that's a lot of stink. And normally I've done that drive many, many times, but one afternoon for some reason, I looked out on all those fellow mammals and it just made me depressed. I just, whoops. Oh, we just, there goes my coffee, so I better be able to make it to the end of the show here. Uh, yes, it's, it was just saddening somehow to see all those animals standing out there. So that inspired this next song. It's called Hamburger Dream. Page 12, now, everybody. The You're thing about Hamburger Dream here is that... <laughs> this is cool. Don't worry about my we got it. All right. It's so uh, I can read through the coffee stain here. Uh, Hamburger Dream has two choruses. You'll notice. So if everybody will pick up their... I'm going to put you all Page the work 12. here. Oh, really? okay. I'm gonna sing the first chorus. Oh, is there enough light to read this on page yeah, yeah. twelve? Oh, yeah. You got you. Page twelve, and you don't even need to. Read. Once you hear the first chorus, you'll you'll get so simple that you'll you'll be able to swing right into the second chorus. And this is a fun song with a little audience participation here. And I'll bet everybody in the room here has more vocal range than I do. So don't be shy about singing out. Uh, but uh, I'll do the first chorus, and then uh, feel free to join in on the second one, and we'll have some fun here. OK, here we go. There's a million black cattle standing outside in the sun. can see Thank you. 
1937, uh, John Steinbeck published a novel called Of Mice and Men. Of Mice and Men, as some of you remember, was the story of George and Lane, two migrant farm workers in the Salinas Valley of California, uh, who uh, moved around from farm to farm doing odd jobs, and they would usually sleep in the barns at the farms they were working on. George was a normal guy, and Lenny was neurologically divergent. He was uh, not at all bright, but he had a heart of gold. And he's this big, hulking guy, heart of gold, really nice, never wants to hurt anything, and he loves to pet soft things. And he loves the idea of one day having a farm with George where they raise rabbits. So he has all the things he can pet. And meanwhile, he likes to find little mice in the barns and pet them. And he pets the little mice, and, he, and then he holds on to them, and he squeezes them, and inadvertently kills them, and puts them in his pocket. And then they start to stink, and George makes them throw them away. And then he finds another little mouse, and says, dang, he loves this little mouse so much. He loves him to death. Oh, and I just... That made me think, you know, the, the Beatles tell us that love is all you need. And John Steinbeck tells us that you don't need too much. <laughs> that stuff's dangerous. <laughs> Traffic knocks me to the floor. 
chance I'll screw it up. <laughs> but let's see. Let's see if I can get it here. The song's called One Stop Early Surely. <laughs> Tubes, rock and roll band. 
it's interesting. They had a number one worldwide hit in about 1980, and they played for 15, 18, 20,000 seat arenas for about three years when they had a few hit records. Uh, to give you an idea of how huge they were in their moment, uh, Bill Spooner, the founder of the Tubes, and their lead guitar player was staying in a hotel in Boston when the Tubes were going to play the Boston Garden. And we got a call from Jackie Kennedy asking if Bill could get tickets for Caroline and John. And Bill got her some tickets. So they were, they were a big band. And uh, Bill Spooner, the founder of that band, this is like 10 years after the Tubes disbanded, was teaching a songwriting class at a school of music in San Francisco called the Blue Bear School of Music. And, you know, she, I knew who the Tubes were and Bill Spooner. So I jumped at the chance to study with this guy. You know, he's a master of rock and roll. Um, some people think he's one of the top five rock and roll guitar players of our time. Um, so I took his class. We got to know him. We got to be friends. And the, for the final exam of this songwriting class was that Bill made arrangements with a small club in San Francisco to have his students perform with a rock and roll band that he had assembled with his buddies, which, you know, they're like killer rock and rollers. So, uh, so I got a chance, I wrote uh, Bag and Groceries around that time. So I was I performed Bag and Groceries with Bill's crack rock and roll band in this little club in Haight-Ashbury. So mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was a real thrill for me. Anyway, here it goes. It, you know, it's one of those, I've got a few songs where in the best of all possible worlds, you might want a drummer and a bass player, but uh, I'll try to just do it here, singer songwriter style. <laughs> Oh, 
next song, uh, it has an interesting origin story in that back when I was getting this daily communication with my songwriting is, I just get dozens of song ideas. And as Jenny mentioned, I carried index cards and wrote them down. I'd write down uh, like a partial verse, maybe a chorus, whatever. Uh, and then those would just collect. And then after maybe a month or two, I'd have a hundred of those and I'd pull them down to maybe 24. And then I would schedule some studio time and go into a recording studio and record what I call scratch demos, which is I'm just singing a cappella into a mic. Like, oh, I saw her in, blah, 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 blah. And the producer I'm working with uh, had a couple of really fabulous producers, Bobby Wyrick or Kevin Harris. Uh, they, those guys really knew music. They were just crack musicians, professionals. They've been in the middle of music since they were babies. And, uh, and they could hear my melody, which is what I would sing in the shower, or what I would sing as I'm walking down the street. And they would be able to arrange it on the spot. On the spot, they could hear, oh, that's a C7 sharp nine. Oh, that's a sus four. That, it, it just, they could, hear a sound, and then they knew music theory well enough to actually write down the chord that they were that they were hearing, a chord that I would, you know, hopefully learn in 10 years to play on the guitar. Uh, so, and we scratch demos, as I'm singing them, they're arranging them. They, they, they can hear it as I'm singing. So, we'd set up, I would always come in with the melody line and the rhythm, and then they would uh, vamp in some keyboard or guitar. And uh, so I would do, I, one, one day I did, in three hours, I did 24 of these. Just boom, 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 boom. 24 song ideas that anybody could listen to that little scratch demo and say, oh, that's worth developing, eh, scratch, you know, you've heard that before. But a smart songwriter could pick out uh, something worth developing. So I would take that. It's amazing how many great songwriting resources that were in the San Francisco Bay Area. Great songwriters, accomplished musicians, former rock stars, just an incredible pool of people and a very, very generous group of people that were accessible to absolute amateurs like me. It's like, I call them up. If you, if you pay for three hours of studio time, then you get to work with this guy who's this accomplished musician. So anyway, uh, I took a songwriting class from uh, a, a, a hit songwriter named Andre Pessis. And every week, uh, me and maybe six or seven other songwriters that were really serious about it, would go over to Andre's house and, and play our scratch demos for him, and uh, or demos, whatever. Uh, and he would guide us through, you know, all this this is a nice idea, you need to develop the chorus, it's got the lyric, it's wacky over here, nobody would ever say that, or nobody, you know, it's like, you know, get real. He, he was just very astute. And he had a track record. He had written uh, a number of, I think, I don't know if it was a number one hitter. He wrote, uh, co-wrote Walking on a Thin Line for Huey Lewis, if you're familiar with the sports album. Sold about eight million copies. Um, and he wrote a hit for Waylon Jennings, so he had connections in Nashville. And he was a, a real, he, he's a guy who sat in his studio and actually wrote songs. He didn't have a second career in it. He was a professional songwriter. So all day, every day, he's writing songs. And he would teach, and then, uh, so I asked Andre if he would listen to my tape of 24 scratch demos and pick the one song that's worth developing. And uh, so he did that, and that's the song I'm gonna play next. <laughs> and then the other 23 just go up in the ether. They're just gone. I never see them again. It said, well, I'd like them at the time, you know, but Andre, I trusted Andre <coughs> enough to know that if he picked a song I should develop, he was so tuned in to what a hit song was, and I wanted to write a hit song. That, uh, that I would develop that song. So uh, this song ended up on one of my albums and uh, it's, uh, it's kind of fun. Anyway, here we go. It's called 
song, There's Nothing Like Another Man. There's nothing like another man to make a fellow want to understand the reason in a woman's mind for the secret she can keep in the quiet all the time. There's nothing like another man to make a fellow want to understand the thing that he's about to lose. He's going to brain for it on the lyric there. I played that song every day for the last two and a half years. He was out busy working at another lyric. Pardon me? He was out busy working at another lyric. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice. That's Janet. She's right on the spot. <laughs> hanging out dead. That's great. It, that brings up a whole interesting subject about how you can know something so well and then brain fart on the thing. But it just evaporates in its entirety. It's like where am I? It's gone. You know, I know it. I could write it down. It's like, but, and then, it's, I don't know. I'm very interested in neuroscience, too, and I wonder about these things. It's like, what, what causes something that you know to evaporate in that moment where you don't want it to evaporate? But since I've surrounded it with such a little, with that little story, it's like, uh, we'll get back. Okay, here we go. <laughs> The reason in a woman's mind for the secret she can keep it in the quiet all the time. There's nothing like another man that make a fellow want to understand. The thing that he's about to lose, he goes out and busy working and another will refuse. I was living free and easy, but I never think I did. I thought I had support back home. I'd see her twice a week, I'd kiss her on the cheek, I'd take her out. San Francisco. He's got a band rehearsal in Petaluma, if you know the Bay Area. Way the hell is on. And uh, after a couple hours of our working on some song project, uh, he asked me if I would drive him to his band rehearsal. And I just thought, you know, you're Bill Spooner and you're famous and all this, but, you know, like, what's in it for me? And uh, so I, I told him, I said, Bill, uh, I have this this tape of this song I just wrote called Upscale Yuppie yep, Seek the Restaurant Blues. And if you introduce this song to your band and ask and see if they're interested in it, 
I'll drive you all the way to Petaluma and wait till you're done rehearsing and drive you home. So he said, okay, that's a deal. So uh, we drove up to Petaluma. He played this song for his band, and they loved it. And, uh, and that was very cool. And then Bill, um, the band is called the Sponge Mummies. Just a sponge mummy, in case you don't know. It's a little styrofoam thing shaped like a baby that you put a newbornish baby in, in the kitchen sink, and then you wash it. And it's when you're done washing the baby, you bring it out. Bill had a couple of kids, and he used sponge mummies to wash his babies. So for reasons known only to Crazy Bill, that's what he named his rock and roll band. And they were the hottest, smokingest rock and roll band in California in the early 90s. So to have, and then I, I'd go around to all these hot clubs in the Bay Area, Santa Cruz, San Francisco, here and there. And they'd be playing my song. So it was a real thrill. It was like, wow, I got a song covered by Bill Spooner. Well, and then uh, Bill uh, made us, he made uh, many albums with the tubes with major record labels. And then on smaller labels, he made a couple of independent records. And on his second solo album, he included Upscale Yuppie uh, on the song list. So I got to hear it play with probably the greatest drummer in all of rock and roll and great bass player. It was really a great experience. And <clears throat> you can listen to it on YouTube. It's on an album called Mall to Mars, like shopping mall. So Bill loves science fiction. He was a brilliant, he's still with us, so he is a, he's a genius. And he's like read every science fiction book known to publishing in English. And uh, he had this idea of someday in the future, Americans would build this giant spacecraft that would uh, fly to Mars and it would just be full of shopping opportunities. <laughs> they had the whole concept all fleshed out. And so that was the theme of this album. So if you get a chance to Google it, listen to it, it's just, it's one of the great rock and roll albums that, that really never got any exposure. Uh, I could go into details about all the reasons and all the little pits that fell in, but nobody's really heard it, but it's got some really smoking rock and roll on it. So that was fun too, to get, to, to get the song played on that album. So it goes like this. I'm more nervous than I thought of it. But yeah, I'm not nervous at all. For weeks, this gig is coming up, I'm not nervous. No nerves, nothing. Or why aren't I getting nervous? I'm just about to do the show. And then earlier today, I wake up, I'm not nervous. I get closer. It's like an hour of approach, I'm not nervous yet. I said, shouldn't I be getting nervous? Isn't, aren't nerves good? You know, like before you do something important, you want to get nervous to get that extra energy. And uh, wasn't nervous until about five minutes before the show, and then I got nervous. And now I'm shaking like crazy trying to remember my lyrics. <laughs> so the, ner the, the, ner the nerves kicked in. <laughs> I can't now, tell. Now I'm trying to do the song while I'm nervous. I'm trying to remember things. So here we go. We'll see if I can remember. Upscale Yuppie. Remember oh. the skinny doctor. He looks like Johnny Carson. He's not much good at love, but he's an expert now at larceny. He slices up the women half a dozen at a time, pays off its turbo Porsche in his house in double time. He's another chubby architect. He thinks he's Frank Lloyd White. He'll creep around your burned out house in the middle of the night. He's leaving you a letter and a resume of boot. He used to be an artist, now he's just a prostitute. <laughs> Tastes like tuna sushi, it smells like country wine. I'll pick me up a blonde haired beauty anytime. Suck those Dixie lemons with a hunger I can't lose. I got a bad case of the upscale, yet we see food restaurant. Sounds like Debbie Harry. She looks like Sandra D. She's gonna be the pinup girl for World War III. The doctor thinks she's sexy. The lawyer thinks she's hot. They're gonna have it all for her in the seafood parking lot. It tastes like tuna sushi. It smells like country wine. I'll pick me up a blonde-haired beauty in 
time. Suck Virginia oysters with a hunger I can't lose. I got pancakes, a little bit of scale, and yeah, greasy food, rest of my blues. Everybody's got their little secrets. Everybody's got their little crimes. Some people tear the tags off their coats. Scale got the doctor slices living all the time. houses burn the ground. You walk through this aftermath and you'd see a chimney and four steel belt patches where the Porsche had evaporated. The car is gone. All the metal is that hot. Wow. Several people died. And you get up into that area and you see hills, hill after hill, and it's all burned. Everything's burned down. And I thought, if any group of people ever needed an architect, it's these people. <laughs> so I, I go under the police line with my resumes and my letter, and I stuck <laughs> where there was no house. <laughs> I could tell you marketing stories all day long, but I'm all bored with those right now. Uh, you know, I've got stories of every one of these. It's funny, there's stories on different levels. There's the story of like, what's the song about? And then there's a whole story about how it was written. And then the story of how it was recorded. And then what happened to it after I had a tape of it or after it was on an album. Uh, and on and on. It's very interesting how they just... Uh, you remember high school science class where you dip the string in salt water and then it creates a crystal? Mm -hmm. You remember? Mm -hmm. It's like that. So you create this song, it's like dropping a string in a super saturated liquid and a crystal forms around it. So you write the songs and then they start accruing history. And uh, it's, it's been very interesting because I wrote most of these songs 35 years ago. And I, I played all these songs with a rock and roll band, uh, which I had to pay every time we did a gig. I was out 800 bucks. And I never played a gig where I made more than 400 bucks from the club owner. So that was a losing proposition. <laughs> I could not afford to get good at that time. It's like, you know, it was a thrill, but it's like too expensive. And the only way I'm going to be able to do this is to go solo. That's the only way it's going to happen. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's uh, what, the story around this song. Let's see, where we go. Oh, yeah, pushback piano. Uh, I'm just, there's like five different avenues I'm trying to think. So first of all, I'll tell you that I stole the title pushback piano from the Thomas McWayne novel. Have any of you ever read a Thomas McWayne novel? 
Thomas LeBlanc is by far my favorite American author. And I've read, I think I've read all the, all, any name you can remember of the famous American author, I've read their books. Theodore Dreiser, John Vespasso's Hemingway, um, his Tinder is the Night, F. Scott Fitzgerald, the photographer. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> F. Scott Fitzgerald, excuse me. Oh. And, uh, and Tom McWayne is my favorite of all, by a long shot. It's just, there's something about his writing that just, it just grabs you. Uh, he wrote a novel called Panama that was published around the time I graduated from the GSD. And I read it then. The protagonist was 10 years older than me. And I thought, this guy is heroic. My God, he's so cool. He was like a rock and roll star and then he got into drugs and he has this wonderful girlfriend that lives in Key West, Florida. And he's, he loves fishing, he loves the outdoors, but he's so madly in love with this woman and hates his guts. And he nails his hand to her front door. It does very crazy shit. Uh, but when I, when I was, in my mid-twenties, this guy was like a towering figure. And then I started reading reviews of this book called Panama uh, over the years. And about 20 years later, I was doing a project using the Stanford Library. And I got into their archive and I read all the reviews of this book. I loved Panama. I loved, I cre I'd read it four times by the time I was doing this research. And uh, in every review, and I've met it there must have got reviewed it. He was like the, the next big thing in American literature. So he's being hailed as the next Ernest Hemingway. You know, he loves the fish and did all the outdoor stuff. Plus he writes like an angel. And, you know, he was, he was such a, his first four books to put him at that pinnacle of American literature. He writes this book, Panama, about this character. I just, it's just so cool. Uh, and he gets trashed. Everywhere, from coast to coast, he just gets gutted by the critics. And I couldn't understand that. This is like, I mean, I was, at the time I was reading all his reviews, I was like 45 years old. I've been old enough to like rock who this character is and what the book's all about. I couldn't understand it. It's like, why doesn't everybody love this novel as much as me? And, uh, and then I, I kept reading it. Like every few years, I'll read it again. And then I finally read it again last year. Uh, and I'm 30 years older than the protagonist now. And I look at this guy and I think, what a dick. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what an insufferable screwball fuck. It's just like, uh, what did I see in him? It, it was fascinating how, as I got older, you read the and it's just a whole different book. It was a 100% different novel. But anyway, McQueen was such a hero for me that uh, I swiped three of his song titles for songs of mine, two of which I'll be playing tonight. And the next one, Bushwhack Piano, is one. The thing about this one is that I borrowed the title, but not the concept. The song concept is Sam Shepard. No uh, who's another kind of cowboy type, you know, who's kind of macho loner types for some reason. I kind of think those guys are cool. So it's got a title from Tom McWayne and the song Notion is more of a Sam Shepard. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Sam Shepard play True West or yeah. some of that stuff, but he's got this this place that he writes about, it's kind of a very deep suburb where a family that's not doing too well has kind of a rundown house. There's usually dust. There's a building with a tin roof. There's a sorry looking cat and a scraggly dog and people just trying to do various and sundry things. It's, it's, it's very, uh, what's the poignant, I guess might be the word. <coughs> Anyway, so here we go. Push that piano. One question before I go any further. 
Uh, there are no monitors here, so I don't have any clue what you're hearing. All I hear is what I'm hearing, kind of my voice bouncing off the microphone. And it sounds to me like I'm popping peas and hissing. No, you're good. No. Okay. Yeah. But it's more yeah. of I would just turn the mic a little bit. Check, check, check. One, two, go oh, lower. No, you sound great, Dad. That's okay, all right. I'll keep plugging away. Um, But 
Remembering that event during my songwriting years inspired this next song. Uh, <laughs> He's riding on my bumper, he's getting on my nerves. I don't see him smiling, I don't even swerve. He's feeling no pain, he ain't feeling any fear. He's got a little fire in my rear view mirror. <laughs> he thinks I'm getting nervous, he thinks I'll fall aside. I'll let him on the gas a bit just to ride his high. He's feeling no pain, he ain't feeling any fear. He got a little Family unknown, like a dog born here. 
I have a song here I was going to sing off the pillow, but uh, I don't know you all well enough to go. <laughs> I'm going to save that for later. Uh, and I want to go to Mike that has a lot more reverb on it that can uh, But this is great for what we're doing. Okay. This next song is called She's Gorgeous in the Nude. Uh, and the woman I was dating at the time that inspired the song was indeed gorgeous in the nude. She had medium length red hair. And you'll notice the woman in my song has long blonde hair. So I do a demo of the song and I'm really proud of it and I take it to her. So I just says, wow, I'm doing it. I wrote a whole song about it. So she listens to the song and she says, who's a woman <laughs> so I told her, well, that's you. I just had to change the hair color because long blonde rhymes better than short red. Long blonde, it's got alliteration, it's got rhyme, it's like something I can work with. And, you know, I love your red hair, but it just doesn't sing. <laughs> so, no, I don't know about you. I'm going to check with my friends. So a couple days later, she, she was a music business executive, had a lot of powerful friends down in Hollywood and all that. And so a couple days later, she says, well, my friend Wawa Watson says, motherfucker cheating on you. <laughs> and then she said, my friend Randy Jackson, who's the Randy Jackson, who was the bass player for Journey, and he was a judge on American Idol for years. She said, Randy so said, you got something on the side. <laughs> so I lost out with her friends, and I just thought, wow, that's so sad that I wrote this beautiful song for her, and yet she didn't, uh, <coughs> she didn't believe it's about her. <laughs> okay, here we go. Coliseum. 
And my friend was standing next to a speaker backstage. Well, she was backstage, very close to the speaker. And by the end of the concert, she was 100% deaf in her right ear. Gone. And uh, she ended up starting an organization, uh, a worldwide organization called H-E-A-R, Hearing Awareness for Rockers. Pete Sound Townsend is a member. And, you know, anymore, if you know a rock and roller's name, you know they have hearing problems. It just goes with, uh, you, don't, you don't have to ask them. Uh, Pete Townsend's almost deaf. They either have tinnitus or or they're just about, it's just about gone. Anyway, so Kathy is very aware of that and has a whole program for helping her. Anyway, she told me a story about when she and her sister were just out of high school, they worked for a car repo company in Houston, Texas, and they drove a Cadillac convertible into the Houston ghetto. And Kathy, at age 19 or 20, would cover her sister with a 45 handgun while her sister went into a driveway and hot wired whatever car it was that was getting repossessed. And after hearing that story, I thought, wow, you know, what they were doing was perfectly legal, but wow, you know, what if it wasn't? I mean, you have this crazy girlfriend that's out committing crimes. <laughs> so I wrote this song called Criminal Girlfriend. <laughs>
Chris sold the ranch, the dog is dead. When I'm all homeless, go with my little head. She didn't understand what the lawyer said. They sold the ranch, the dog is dead. They paid the land, they damned the stream. They're putting them all, they're tearing up the trees. It's tearing up my heart to see it in this way. This is progress, take me today. Another life's blood will no matter that you slay. Won't be a while when they lay in the grave. The old frame hogs, the blue wooden hog. Caterpillar tractor and a three dollar dog. They ran off to the sea in the middle of the night.
this song is called Crimson Marble. It's one of the early songs I wrote. Um, I actually started writing this, gosh, when I was working in Greece uh, a long time ago. Uh, Crimson Marble is her heart tonight. Hard and cold, a block of stone. She pays me back for staying out all night. Now she just wants to be alone. She said the next time is the last time. One more time and we'd be through. But I'm a hopeless, passionate gambler. I took a chance, there's nothing new. I stretched our love out to the limit. Southern accent and think I'm just some northern goofball 
a little bit for faking it. Mm -hmm. I lived in the South. I lived in uh, Arkansas. I lived in North Carolina when I was in the Army for two years. I lived in Georgia. And uh, when I was a real little kid, I spent a year in Australia and came back with a rock solid Australian accent. So <laughs> when you hear a little southern accent in these songs, it's, it's right there. Uh, so uh, we were in Arkansas at the turn of the seasons, from wintertime when everything's frozen, hard, cold. It gets very cold in Arkansas, no wintertime. And uh, the very first weeks of spring, when uh, the, the land thaws and just this incredible array of snows and the pine trees and the wildflowers and the bushes, whatever it is that's growing, it's just radiating these great aromas. Um, the weather's getting warmer and it's very beautiful and we live not far from a pine forest so I'm out walking in this little forest thinking about my grandparents uh, both of whom uh, the men of the families uh, were loggers they uh, were loggers in logging camps in eastern Oregon and northern California one grandfather spent 10 hours a day on one end of a 12 foot long saw and he was an Irishman and he loved his alcohol on the weekends. So he would have his coworkers hand him a sandwich while he kept sawing through the lunch break, through that half hour, so he could spend that money on liquor on Friday and Saturday night. So I was thinking about that and I thought, well, where did, we, where did all this happen? It happened in some little jeep joint, some, um, just some little roadside, dive where there's some great music and dancing and where these men that are just working harder than humans that have ever worked physically just go to let off steam. So uh, this is a song about a place called the Chicken Shack and they do a dance called the Chicken Drive. <laughs>
last song here is uh, Panama Banana Mom. It's another one of those songs that I didn't write it, I just wrote it down. Uh, it's the first song I ever wrote. Uh, so I was out jogging out of the boonies on Fort Bragg in 1970 uh, in the Army. Uh, it's a hot day, you can smell the asphalt, and once again, aromatic pine trees. Uh, and I hadn't written any songs at all up to that point. Uh, guitar playing was decades in the future. I'm not a songwriter. I don't identify as a songwriter, but here comes this song. And it's, it's kind of a calypso thing, kind of a, and I, I thought, well, what the hell? What's happening here? What, why am I channeling all these lyrics? And uh, all I could think of was that, uh, Back to that time when my family lived in Australia, my mother took a stack of 78 records with us over to, uh, to Australia. And one of those records was a Harry Belafonte record that had Jamaica Farewell on one side and a banana boat song on the other side. Do you know, do you recall Jamaica Farewell? Is that rainy, bells rain? Beautiful songs, number one hits back in the ancient history. This is before rock and roll. That's how far back it was. It was Bill Haley and the Comets and rock, and rock Around the Clock was like later that year. So it was way back. So I'm like a little guy, and, but I'm hearing this song a lot. Like, you know, she played it every day for weeks. And so what I think was happening was uh, I heard that song and my brain is just tumbling this Harry Belafonte clip so it's thing around for 15 years and then, all right, here it comes. So, analog and analog, here we go. guitar skills such as they are. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate this, especially my GSP. It's really a treasure. Thank you all so much. Okay, if you're up for it, we're going to have a little after party today here at the Art House Hotel, which is a really beautiful space. If you haven't seen that, uh, starting sometime soon and whatever, just a little schmoozy. I was thinking about all the people that I knew were coming to this event, and I thought, my God, there's enough brain power in this room to restart civilization. <laughs> <laughs>